you're also kind of a rare person to meet in the forums because usually the conversations had in regards to evidence for God is, you know, and then the list goes on and on and on and on on the theist yeah. side. So interesting meeting you. Well, and- you know, honestly, I, I, I always laugh about this because I actually get along better mostly with atheists than I do Christians because I've always <laughs> insisted on being psychologic or, or being intellectually sincere, right? I, I've always told myself it's not in any way profitable to me to believe in something if it isn't true. And so that was sort of the atheist inside of me, right? It's like, if I believe in something that's not true, maybe it comforts me, but that's not really going to be useful to me in, in real life, right? Well, then let's go t- with the idea of, of God then, because the way you explained pink and made it analogous to how our brains make up for this thing, which we don't know in the physical universe, but we're searching for psychologically. And that thing we have come to label as God, the three letter sound that we make with our mouth. Um, how, how is kind of that take any different from what we see is the evolution of the idea of God you know, from 50,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago or 8,000 years ago to now where it started off, you know, God was, you know, in the, in the stream or in the wind or in the lightning and then God became a being and then, you know, so forth. How do we actually, and you're a Roman Catholic, how do we, <laughs> how do we work back in your analogy, which is beautiful, by the way, like that's something definitely to consider, you know, there is no color pink. You know, there there is no God because we're not touching God. But at the same time, something's there and we are experiencing something. And I'm interested to find that thing which you've indicated and which I believe we're referring to as God. How do, how, how do we know we're not just misdirected and talking about old stories revamped and made new and, and what we call God now? Well, actually, that's a subject that I I did a three part video series on uh, the history of God or the evolution of God. And it's terribly fascinating because when you go back to the foundations of religious ideas, uh, the best source that we have are Paleolithic cave paintings and rock art. And this proved a big mystery for anthropologists for years and years and years trying to understand what Paleolithic cave art was representing. And it was actually a researcher, Dr. David Lewis Williams in South Africa, who used the paintings of the sand bushmen to essentially unlock that what the sand bushmen were painting were their experiences of altered states of consciousness. So, you know, they're perhaps uh, like, for instance, the Native Americans here in Canada out on the plains, they will sit in a sweat lodge and they will sweat and sweat and sweat until they begin to hallucinate. And, uh, you know, the Wojcicl Indians of Mexico, they'll use peyote. Uh, the, uh, the shamans of Siberia will use mushrooms. You know, there, there are all these different traditions throughout the world where in which the aboriginals were looking for meaningful information through their dreams and their hallucinations. And this really served as the foundation of religious experience. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, actually, uh, it's out of a book, Fire in the Brain. And uh, this researcher, he goes down there with a Weichel shaman, and the Weichel shaman says to him, there's no such thing as hallucinations. There are only truths, was what he told him. And, uh, you know, you got to think, I mean, that is a direct opposite way of thinking to Western rational consciousness, right? We, We use hallucination as a synonym for nonsense, right? If you want to make fun of somebody, you say, oh, you're just hallucinating. But here's this Weichel shaman saying, no, 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 these are not nonsense, these are truths. But they understand them always as metaphorical truths or symbolic truths that refer to some reality within the psyche. And it seems that what happened over time is that people were doing what's called projecting. So Carl Gustav Jung, he was really the the psychologist who understood this, where if you have a psychological reality within w- inside of you, you can project it into external things. And so what ancient people would do is they would project realities with themsel- within themselves into the stones, into the plants, into the storm clouds, so that they talk about the spirit of the storm or the spirit of the mountain. 
But what they're actually referring to is something within themselves. And the only culture in the world that seems to have fully recognized that was India, the Buddhists and the Hindus. But I mean, I, ha I don't want to build up India too much because, I mean, you have some pretty goofy nonsense in India as well. Uh, but India really, you know, people who have tried to make sense out of the evolution of religious ideas uh, always look to India because India really, you know, unlocked this. And uh, it's amazing because you even have Hindus who refer to themselves as atheists. They say there's no God out there. The only God that exists is in here. So, you know, do you really, can you really say God exists <laughs> at that point, right? So at the end of one of my documentaries called Reshaping Reality, Rise to Reason, um, you can find it on the Fully Deconverted page. Um, that was my documentary where I came out as a non-believer. And the way that it ends is I fly up into the air and I call myself a god. And the reason why I do that is because at the time I was quite convinced that everything that we humans have come to refer as a, a God is exactly what you were just talking about. Everything outside here um, is a projection of what's going on inside our minds. And that seems all too obvious when you read the Bible or when you mm -hmm. hear people talk about their other religions, like it seems like a projection, especially when you ask people for their personal experiences. Um, like my dreams, man, I was, I was in some kind of crazy churches at the time and I was younger. <laughs> So I had some influences on me, right? Playing with my emotions and my mind and, you know, and then you have these fantasies about going to heaven or meeting God because you have some, you know, your wacky religious family members who are telling you all these crazy stories also. So that influences you. And um, anyways, that's the way my documentary ended. And I couldn't think where else does God come from if not in us? And well, that's yeah. That's exactly, that's Buddhism. I mean, you've just described the message of the Buddha almost word for word where, you know, one of my favorite stories about the Buddha actually is uh, it said that uh, the Buddha told someone there is no God and everyone was, you know, this was conservative India. So everybody was all worked up and they're all gossiping and saying, oh, this spiritual teacher just said there's no God. And uh, the next day, an atheist comes to him and he says, oh, Buddha, I'm just so pleased to hear that you have denied the existence of God. I have been struggling against this my whole life. Finally, a guru is willing to admit it. And the Buddha says, well, I don't know where you heard that. There most definitely is a God. And the atheist, he, what the hell is he talking about, right? So then the next day, another man comes and he says, well, I heard a rumor going around that you said there was no God. And then you said there was a God, and I'm just so glad that you clarified this. I have been a devotee of God my whole life, and I'm just so glad that you have clarified that there is, in fact, a God. And the Buddha said, well, I don't know where you, he where you heard that. There is most definitely not a God. And so he leaves completely confused. And one of his disciples come to him, and they say, you know, yesterday you say this, today you say that. Which is it? And the Buddha says, believing in God or not believing in God doesn't mean anything. You could believe in God and be a total jerk, you know, throughout your entire life. But what's important is that you have the questions and that you seek and experience for yourself. That was the Buddha's emphasis where he said, you know, believing in a thing is not sufficient. You need to have the direct experience for yourself. And I think that in, in our culture today, atheism is pointing that out, that it's pointing out the absurdities of Christianity. But I, I think that at the same time, the danger is that Christianity has divorced us from the reality of the unconscious mind to such a great extent that this situation, you know, between Christians who insist on a literal physical God and the atheists who are labeling it as all nonsense is creating a hell of a situation for mental health issues. And we see that in America, you know, you see anxiety, depression, you know, suicide, all of these things are the result of the fact that people are not engaging with the intuitive realities of life, with these instinctual powers. And, uh, you know, it's it's gonna continue to grow until, well, who knows? Either, either one power will win out or hopefully Western civilization will get its head out of its ass. <laughs> so how can Western civilization get its head out of its ass <laughs> if, if all we know is what we've been taught, how do we turn this around? How long would it take? 
And is it fair to say then, uh, like how I believe uh, Christopher Hitchens said, that religion, such as we know it, does in fact poison everything? How do we turn this around? Why And why should we believe you that religion or religious experiences or being a Roman Catholic, like there's some sort of advantage to that when there's a lot of people who experience exactly what you described, and that is the anxiety inducing behaviors or institutions which force or compel upon us to conform to its dogma or else be ostracized or dehumanized in the various ways which it does. Well, I think that I think everything in life has a has a bright side and a dark side. And certainly there are some significant dark sides to religion. But the you know, the the very uh, the definition of religion, as uh, Joseph Campbell and Carl Gustav Jung understood it, is religion is the language of the unconscious mind communicating with the ego system. So quite literally, religion and the forms of mythology are the dialect, the language, the symbolic words that we use to communicate with our psychological powers, the psychological energies within our within ourselves. And I think, you know, if, if you look at some statistics, I mean, there are increased suicide rates among atheists. Now, I mean, you could legitimately argue that this is a result of uh, atheists feeling socially ostracized because they don't accept the, the fairy tale of everyone else. But I do think that there is something to be said for the feelings of well-being that can arise from having a uh, religious experience. And if for no other reason, I'm just attesting to it myself, where it's deeply enriched my life. And I can honestly say that it is the single most satisfying thing that I, that I have as, uh, in my life as an experience. And uh, I mean, you know, I've, I've been on both sides of it. I've been an atheist. I've been a Christian. I've been a Buddhist. You know, I've, I've journeyed through a lot of these different things. And I don't look at any of those stages in my journey as being right or wrong. They were just various steps on a path to me basically recognize and accepting this truth that dwells within the heart, this truth that is appropriate to the mind, more or less.